I am so honored to be the moderator of such a, a prolific panel of thinkers and curators and colleagues. Um, I just wanted to maybe give a little bit of structure how I wanted to start the conversation. Um, the title Geographies of the Imagination actually comes from a project that um, Antonia will talk about shortly, but um, since every everyone here uh, works with you know geographies and, and through their practice tries to un unhinge or unpack the problems um, the, of the cohere the the inherent problems of defining nations and power and the power of geography. I wanted to first uh, maybe ask each each of you to kind of reflect or think through um, their practice and maybe talking through their work. Um, Tell us a little bit what you, how you see the word, the term geography or the term imagination. And I would like to start first with Raphael. Um, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Christine. And thank you uh, for coming, for you, the audience, and also my colleagues here. Uh, first and foremost, I would really want to take this opportunity to pay respect to our two colleagues who passed on, uh, Missy Silva, who was a sister, a friend, who played a very, very important role for me to be able to go back to my geographical location, which is Zimbabwe. And secondly, uh, a brother who I met when he did uh, curate the, first, the second Johannesburg Biennale, which was um, very, very important in the practice of artists and curators in Africa, who is none other than Okwi and Wenzo, who passed on as well. So these are some of the two key people who left us too early, but their, part, their role they played in the visibility and the platform they created for artists within Africa and outside Africa is very important. But going back to the, the, the question, which is uh, geographies of imagination, and also looking at where I come in in my practice. Uh, as a curator who works for a national institution in Zimbabwe, uh, one of the key most important things is to be able to do exhibitions in and outside Zimbabwe. Um, when I was approached on this uh, issue and the conversation, I thought of an exhibition we did in 2011. The first Zimbabwe Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2011, which was entitled Seeing Ourselves, questioning the geographical landscape and the space we occupy from yesterday and today. That exhibition was an entry point into uh, the Venice Biennale, which has been very, very questionable in terms of the visibility of countries coming from Africa. And I'm sure when Robert Stoll uh, curated um, the Venice Biennale many years ago, there was a question of why there has never been an African country pavilions at the Venice Biennale. And that really became very, very controversial. But for uh, other curators and other artists in Africa, there was a need for us to be able to respond. Then later on, there was the so-called African Pavilion, which was curated by Simon Jami and um, Fernando Alvim. So those were some of the interventions that really, for us and for myself in my practice, I felt there's a need for us to be able to speak back to what was being conceived as uh, a country, and yet uh, Africa is one of the largest continent uh, on earth. So later on, when I joined the National Gallery in 2010, I gave birth to the Zimbabwe Pavilion where we showcased four artists, but also looking at how we can imagine ourselves into this uh, space called Venice Biennale. And for a country that is coming from uh, isolation, being ostracized from the international community, how do we enter this imagined space 
that we're all looking for and that we all continue to question. So that was the intervention that I did through my practice by putting up some of the artists through their practice, which is Tafuma Gutsa, uh, Kelvin Dondo, Mishek Masambu, who is actually showcasing here at the uh, at Basel in Hong Kong, then uh, Berry Biko. So those were the four artists we showcased. Then later on, after the first edition, we continued to showcase artists at the Venice Biennale up to the present, and we're working next on the uh, um, the next Venice Biennale, which will be happening in a month's time or two months' time in May, uh, where we have also selected a number of artists. So the imagine the imagination that we have as a country that still is struggling from a very very fragile political situation is to imagine the future and what will be the future for the artists in Zimbabwe and what will be the future for the visibility of African pavilions or African country pavilion at the Venice Biennale. But also looking at what has been created after the Magician de la Terre, which was a very, very important turning point for artists of color, for artists who are coming from uh, uh, the diaspora as well, because the repetitive voice of the diaspora curators that includes um, Okwi, Simon Jami, uh, Salah Hassan, Jelan Tawandros, and many others, and including Bisi, who also departed. They played a very, very important role to look at how African countries can be represented in most of the institutions within the Western metropolis. So for us in, in the continent, those repetitive voice, we need to acknowledge them, uh, but also the diaspora artists who also are playing a very, very important role for the visibility and the vocalization of uh, why it is important for artists coming from the continent to be able to be showcased in some of these platforms. Today, you see a number of artists who are showcased in a number of binales from Cuba to Sydney to Guangzhou, but it was also because those repetitive voices played a pivotal role, and for us, who are working and practicing in the continent for us to be able to imagine further and to take, create platforms within the continent, which include the Dakar Binale, the Bamako Encounters, which is, will be happening end of the year, and the Jobek Art Fair and the Cape Town Art Fair that are taking place. And we've got a new baby that is uh, the Art X Lagos, which is actually a new baby in uh, West Africa that is also creating platforms for the artists to be able to imagine the future and to also think beyond our geographical location. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, um, um, yeah, I think um, you pointed out a couple of points I think we can go back to later, um, like the term visibility, representation. They're very loaded and almost, I would say, double-edged sword that depending on what you know, how different institutions choose to kind of uh, choose to approach these terms. But um, we can hold on to that thought. And I, I think um, when you talked a lot about the future, I think Natasha would have an interesting, through her projects, kind of maybe um, give a different definition of imagination, maybe that is not necessarily forward looking, but more speculative and looking back to an art history or a kind of um, different kind of art history. Thank you um, for having us and for bringing us together through um, the conversations program also to Stephanie um, each year. The last time I was here, um, I was actually presenting in conversation with um, Chitish uh, Khalad and um, Hamad talking about the project uh, at the Venice Biennale, which was called My East is Your West. In a way, it kind of also alludes to the possible geographies of the imagination brought together an artist from India and Pakistan to co-present um, uh, at the Biennale. But I wanted to go into also this question of um, genealogy and lineage, because it feels, I mean, when you pay tribute, um, it feels that our role as curators and 
mediators of a certain kind of historicity involves um, this, again, quite uh, this big responsibility to pay tribute, to locate um, where the circulation is articulated from and where to break away from a generation and where to continue to resist through the work of others before us. Um, and I have been kind of feeling uh, the need to, to kind of play that role, especially in relation to uh, certain recent projects, which included Documenta 14, where, um, just to mention, one of uh, our key artists uh, from the South Asian context uh, was an amazing figure called K.G. Subramanian, who was not only an artist, but an educator, cultural critic. Um, and he, what we saw by including him was that we were actually um, including somebody who was a mentor to two other generations of artists who were in the same documenta. And um, he be also before, by basically by the end of, uh, of the edition, uh, he had passed on. So uh, there was this very key work of his called War of the Relics, um, a 16 panel work, which had traveled around India to several smaller locations. So when you talk about geography also, one is very conscious to think what are the key works that travel within the place that they are made from? How are they received there? What is their role? And then what does it mean to, uh, in a sense, temporarily adopt them and give them a frame within a global exhibition? So these are actually some of the images that are being shown now are from that work. The other thing I wanted to mention um, is an exhibition uh, in which I did one chapter uh, along with uh, several other curators, which was called Hello World, Revising a Collection at the Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin. Uh, one was quite hesitant to actually take on this mandate to revise a collection for a, germ, a big German institution. You know, sometimes you feel sort of maybe, you know, who must do the homework and who should do the revising and, you know, what does it mean to take take on that kind of uh, burden, perhaps, right? Uh, but at the same time, having lived in Berlin for some years now, it was a really exciting moment to open up the walls, the storage spaces, to go into the storage of the ethnological museum um, in Dalem and actually bring out these modernist artworks uh, from the in, from India. Um, from the between, you know, starting from the 50s to the 70s, that had just been lying there collecting dust, basically, and to put them center stage at the National Gallery. So, in a way, it was like building an agenda. It was like pressing the reset button, um, but also trying to think about how to create. Um, what Stuart Hall referred to as a double perspective. So to build this double perspective in a way that these works of Indian modernism were not isolated anymore, but actually there was also an additive process. So one of the things I did there was to uh, present together this um, really a significant painting of George Gross, together with um, these prints, quite subversive satirical prints of Gogonindranath Tagore, which were made at the same time. So you have George Gross talking about the pillars of society as a kind of a, a satirical take on the years of the war and the role of religious conservatism and uh, Nazi rule. And at the same time, you have Gogonindranath Tagore from Bengal, who is talking about westernization of the elite, who's talking about the impact of colonization uh, on, on the intelligentsia um, and, and the caste hierarchy. So to present these works in parallel was my sort of way of trying to think about another imaginary um, and insert it um, in a way that it would rupture perhaps the past of what representation of modernism has meant in this institution. So those were some things I wanted to highlight for now. All right. 
Well, um, well I'm sure we're gonna deep dive into other examples. Um, I, I I thought what you mentioned the word like isolation actually now is the second time that also came back came in this conversation. You mentioned it in the context of the Zimbabwean pavilion, like how you know to to connect to or imagine you know. Um, um, Zimbabwean artist in an international stage. Um, and I think that's actually a really interesting segue into Mi's um, kind of work right now um, as her project is focused on uh, Eurasia as a kind of a produced or like like a, a term, that an, an idea that's so loaded with all kinds of projections and could political projections or economic projections. And I think maybe you can share a little bit how, in this case, uh, through this Silk Road project, through uh, Eurasia, this project, re unmapping it, how do you relate to geography and this imagination? Thank you. Um, also, thank you, Stephanie, for uh, inviting us. And thank you to all the co-panelists for being here. And um, so I came just a few seconds too late to pick where I sit. <laughs> and I have to be positioned in the middle. Um, I thought it might not be so bad an idea, because um, the topic that I engage with um, for years has been uh, Eurasia, or the Silk Roads. Um, as a connection or possibility of connection uh, of real geographies, but also of imaginative uh, geographies. So in that context, I think I'll speak from where I am. Um, so what is Eurasia? This is a project that, um, it is a life project for me to uh, travel to different parts of uh, Eurasia. It is. Uh, it articulates itself in various projects, sometimes exhibitions, sometimes discursive uh, programs, sometimes uh, performative for programs, but increasingly also more um, into the dimension of sustaining a network that shares um, the same values, and I'll speak more about that later. Um, and all of it uh, revolves around Eurasia. But what is Eurasia? The more I started dealing with it, the more I realized that there are different Eurasias. Um, put very simply, it is the ge geography of um, the geographical continent of Europe and Asia together. But actually, the way we understand it has always been uh, conditioned by the separation of Europe and Asia um, at the first place. So it's almost counterintuitive to think of uh, Eurasia as one entity. That is one. Um, when you talk to Russian-speaking or ex-Soviet um, uh, people from ex-Soviet countries, their understanding of Eurasia is actually east of Europe and west of Asia, meaning <laughs> is the ex-Tsarist uh, Russian empire. Um, and of course, uh, there's a revival of Russian Eurasianism these days, um, headed by Alexander Dugin, who is a Heideggerian and a political ph philosopher who proposes that Russia should embrace its Eurasian roots, i.e. turning away from the West and, and looking into the East. He is really by far not the first person who uses Eurasia to um, uh, propel any political agenda. There was, a, um, there was already a, 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 a movement of Eurasianism in the 20s. There was actually a right-wing and a left-wing fraction of Eurasianism back then, which is one of the things that we're researching on with um, a Russian uh, associate, a collaborator of ours, uh, Nikolai Smirnov. Um, and then, of course, there is the current uh, economic projection that, again, takes the Silk Road or Eurasia as a rhetoric of um, um, establishing economic ties and building infrastructure projects across the continent under the name of, of course, BRI. So in looking at these different claims on Eurasia, we feel we have to um, first understand what they are um, in order to undo or untie some of the problems um, and complexities around it. So most currently, starting around last April, um, I started a project with Bina Choi, who is a Korean curator working at um, Casco Art Institute, working for the Commons in Holland, in Utrecht, um, a project called Unmapping Eurasia, which exactly tries to first map Eurasia in order to unmap it. 
And it takes, again, different uh, uh, um, forms um, and has different iterations that keeps on evolving. And the more we engage with um, this type of emergence, the more actually institutional partners, and not just our institutional partners, but also social agents such as NGOs working on ecological issues and working on uh, civil societies and questions of governance in various parts of Eurasia um, come up. So we're trying to sustain this kind of network. Um, and in not just um, unpacking this geopolitical aspect of, of Eurasia, but trying to also bring back something of, um, for lack of better words, we say uh, geopoetics, um, which is deeply ingrained in various um, belief systems, cosmologies of nomadic tribes or of different peoples across Eurasia. So you might have seen um, one picture that I have um, in passing, which uh, is is actually a mod from a Russian modernist painter, but it features the motifs of um, uh, various tribal um, uh, uh, icons, and uh, specifically uh, whales and deers. So deers is uh, deer is actually a, a, a motif that you find among many different uh, nomadic tribes because of the feature of the antlets sort of a prehistory, prehistorical antenna. Um, it is believed to be a medium between the human and the above Ryan. And the whale actually is also a, a, a singular um, animal, which is an anti-modern animal, <laughs> if you like, because it has fully evolved um, to live on the land, but decided to go back to the sea. So we have um, another close associate of ours, um, Kim Nam Su, who is a Korean um, curator and dramaturg. He has a crazy theory that the deer was the predecessor of the whale. And there seems to be some kind of biological evidence for that. Um, so I'm bringing up this example to 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 give a very different kind of imagination of what what kind of network um, we are uh, we have actually once had um, before um, the space of Eurasia is um, delineated into na uh, nation states, uh, where um, when we think about network, we're thinking about internet, which has this predecessor of uh, the uh, telegrams, which were actually um, uh, put in uh, put in place to serve the imperial, the British imperial um, expansionist missions. So we're thinking about different kinds of networks, and this is very much in the spirit of another Eurasianist, um, uh, Namjoon Pak, who is also thinking and speaking a lot about Eurasian information highway uh, in the pre-modern period. So Pak and Yusuf Boys has has engaged um, in a series of dialogues and they tried to um, start a Eurasian project together. So that's also one of the inspirations. Um, so I thought maybe I'll put these things on the table. Yeah, I think um, the notion of infrastructure and network seems to be something that I think uh, all the projects somehow in one way or the other, either through um, just finding shared affinities or, or finding like conversation partners, it feels like these projects need its own organic networks and or sometimes um, support like governmental support or um, nonprofits as um, me, you're talking about how you're also trying to work with other NGOs to not only with your research, as I understand, um, to also put it back and give, give offer this research to people who have um, um, a stake or, or power in politics to help sh uh, create social change in a way. So but anyway, um, we can hold that thought and we can maybe now um, pass the mic to um, Antonia where um, you can maybe give us um, yeah, a definition or like the, the thinking behind this exhibition that has defined or is the framework that of this uh, talk today. Um, yeah, again, thank you for inviting me and thank you, Stephanie, for yeah, building this panel. And um, so well, I find interesting almost everything you actually talked about kind of touches upon um, yeah, Geographies of Imagination, which was an exhibition that I curated together with my colleague uh, Bonaventure Indikung um, at Savi Contemporary uh, just in September last year. And uh, 
to be honest, it was actually quite a maybe cynical take um, on a number of, let's say, invitations that we had received in recent times um, and the time of the type of framings, let's say, in which we were actually invited to participate, which we often find found highly reductive and 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 with an impulse to want to also categorize very clearly um, our work in relationship to the type of geographies that we ultimately uh, were invited to represent. Um, so. I'll, I'll, I'll get more profoundly, maybe uh, shortly, in what I mean. But actually, geographies of imagination is a um, is a quote uh, from uh, Michel Raff Rolf Trujillo, who's a Haitian anthropologist, and he actually talks about uh, imagination as a factor that um, essentially encourages and makes possible the construction of otherness. So, geographies of imagination are actually what the West needed to build about the non-West in order to legitimize its supremacy. So the other in this imagination slides between either hellish or utopian extremes. An other that hence needs to be taken care of in an extremely paternalistic sense uh, through so-called reason and, and justice. And so this was a little bit our starting point. So it was really not not looking very much into, let's say, imagination as a means of resistance, but actually imagination, a stereotyped imagination as a means of oppression. Um, and, you know, to that also hence geography as a tool of power. And so also think about cartography and mapping as disciplines that are, of course, uh, you know, neutral per se, but can be easily instrumentalized and also represent a kind of bird eye view of privilege, so to speak. Um, that said, I think I wanted to respond maybe to a few things that were said because I feel that also, you know, this exhibition you know, was part of the work of Savi Contemporary and speaks to the work of Savi Contemporary more broadly. I feel this is not something that was sort of addressed with one exhibition, but was actually at the core maybe of the founding even of the institution. So for, for who doesn't know, Savi is a, is a space that was founded in 2009 um, in Berlin by Bonaventure Ndiko, who's a Cameroonian writer, curator, and, and, and biotechnologist, actually. Um, and, and the reason behind founding Savi was really to kind of... Um, create in Berlin a space where other knowledges, let's say, that were very often um, uh, segregated into uh, museums that maybe didn't even really directly uh, relate to cultural practices, could actually find a place to express themselves, so to speak, to find a meeting space, um, and, a and also a place for self-determination, almost, I would say. So a, spa a space where these would not be you know, generically described, easily categorized, reduced to a few political events. Um, and so it was, it was and still is. I mean, of course, 10 years later, a lot of things have changed in Berlin and a lot of, you know, cultural institutions also have sort of, let's say, updated their programs. Um, but that was really the raison d'etre, which I feel, you know, uh, savvy in the sense sort of continues to, to, to hold on to. Um, so, I, and I think there it is quite important to think about a programmatic and engagement versus what, what we feel also very often museums and cultural institutions have the tendency to do, which is to do temporary shows, you know, which may engage with one topic or the other that is outside of their, you know, usual, whatever, Eurocentric framework, uh, that then sort of becomes a checkpoint into, okay, yeah, we have dealt with, you know, other perspectives and other cultures and so on and so forth. I mean, of course, I'm talking a lot about European cultural institutions uh, more than anything else. And, uh, you know, in this sense, I think that the institutional engagement of Savi is a programmatic engagement that is long-term, uh, that takes time to unfold. Um, and I think that's extremely important. Like, how do you engage with time also in order to understand and to unravel and to... And, and, and that's where the question of representation also becomes tricky, right? Like, because it's not easy to represent in short time frames. You know, it's not easy to represent with few artists. You know, how do you represent the 54 African countries? You know, like, how do you... Uh, uh, how do you actually engage more profoundly with also demographics that is very present in the city? And that was also the thing with Berlin. I mean, uh, you know, uh, it, it, and, and in many European cities, the, there is a kind of self-representation that is absolutely not representative of the wider society that actually lives in the city. And so how do you, um, how do you highlight that? How do you engage with all the knowledges that are actually present? And, and I guess that's generally, um, you know, what, what we, try to do and I guess this exhibition maybe among others was 
um, was also emphasizing. Um, yeah, I think, you know, this spills up a little bit on our conversation yesterday, but um, since you now brought up this idea of, like, not really just focusing on one thing that, you know, Savi did, but it's about building that institutional space or kind of this, you wrote, uh, I, I read in your text, a diasporic space, like where, where you know, there's a space where these kind of imaginations could somehow, uh, many of them, not a singular one, it could be all very fractured or very multiple, could somehow exist in one way or the other. I think I have two questions, maybe loosely directed to all of you guys, but then you can choose to respond in whatever way that relates to any of the projects you would like to talk about. Um, one thing I was really th interested to know, like in terms of formats, like the, are, if you since you talk about exhibitions and programs, I wonder if are exhibitions still very, are, are they kind of productive formats? In, in you know I'm just just kind of throwing it out there since we are curators and we and for example in particular me your project has a very like a diverse programming like different ways of manifesting these research like how do you as a curator think about this um, exhibition at, it, as a format in itself and how as an institution or in your engagement either building an institution or interfering in an institution, think about this idea of representation and, I mean, problematize it or also challenge this idea of representation as window dressing. Like, how do you deal with that? I can go, I mean, um, just as an, as a, I mean, for, I, I think exhibitions are still very important. I, I don't think necessarily that they exhaust though the type of programs and activities that we can do. So just to say, for example, Geographies of Imagination, which is part of a larger program of uh, events and, and um, that actually has to do with the notion of disordering. So really thinking about what is the role of cultural institutions in undoing that construction and what can be done differently, in fact. One of the uh, just things that I want to mention is that part of it is actually uh, mapping research in terms of um, who actually makes institutions and under which terms and conditions. So we're actually looking at the sort of types of contracts <laughs> and uh, that, that museums actually provide uh, for, for, for their staff and who their staff is. So we're doing this research in Berlin, Vienna and Brussels predominantly because of uh, a European collaboration and uh, essentially a European grant. But really the question for us is also structurally, like how are museums ready to change structurally, you know? But because very often when you actually then look at that, even just contractual forms, you realize the sort of hierarchy also of decision making and the possibility of critique that different types of contracts actually actually provide you. So I mean, in general, I mean, apart from of course discursive programs, you know, lectures, screenings, book presentations, uh, whatever panels, symposia, etc. I think it is important to try to think about formats that can be more invasive and maybe even more threatening in a sense, because then you know, I feel like by unveiling the infrastructure and not just the content that is built on stage, you actually kind of also maybe are more able to um, understand the relationship between the two, you know, and the possibility of wanting to actually to engage with some of this topic deeply and bodily, if we think about the body of the institution and long-term versus you know, short temporary exhibitions. Um, I, I wanted to respond to that also by kind of putting forth how um, I believe that exhibition formats are being kind of interrogated really productively, especially in the last few years where um, the process of using the exhibition as a mode of thinking, expanded thinking as a mode of assembly is becoming more and more uh, part of the framework, really. So, um, in well, in a, as a as a kind of a recent example, um, at the Gropius Bau in Berlin, where I'm I'm associated, under our current director Stephanie Rosenthal, her one of her first questions was, how can this historic building in the center of Berlin? in the center of Berlin as it were, as it, with its history of being a divided city, how can it be opened up to the public in a way that, uh, so part of the building can, um, 
really be a place of gathering um, and and you don't have to pay the ticket essentially so she made this big move of um inviting an artist to 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 take take over the Lishthof the atrium uh, which is currently Shiaru Shiota and we just saw how in a in a day basically when when the doors opened without this restriction it was not only an exhibition space it was also very organically a public space a civic space and that felt uh, like a kind of a physical shift so it's a moment for institutions to really make those changes in a sustainable way but also in a you know in a way that you know one has to say if not now then when um and also um in terms of at least in 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 my own practice the the kind of what it does it mean to journey with thinkers is something that i'm constantly asking so what does it mean for the exhibition to have these kind of uh, companions who may be writers poets anthropologists who have other kind of modes of knowledge making how do they actually travel with you how do they intervene within your exhibition making process this is something that um you know is a big concern and it was also the case with documenta 14 with um paul preciado uh, and other collaborators doing the parliament of bodies where it's still a format that will travel it's still a a kind of staging that has such an intimate yet uh, a kind of strong residue that people are still using that kind of model to uh, gather in the city so i think it's an excellent uh, discussion point and i also admire <laughs> the um contributions of uh, of the colleagues um um and um so yeah so in the in the engagements in uh largely in european institutions and i think maybe also starting now with certain in asian institutions uh we could afford such a space of uh, openness of as natasha put this um um most of yeah exhibition as most of assembly and most of uh, expanded thinking um i would just put maybe a uh, provocation on the table is there a way for us to um put on equal footing this mode of engagement um and um a very different kind of practice in a context where there is not a contemporary art center right so i'm talking about specifically of this vast span of space somewhere starting from say ekaterinburg eastward until you reach vladivostok there are and we go all the way to the to the to the north pole and down to say the steppes area so kazakhstan we if you take out kazakhstan there are about three contemporary art centers in ekaterinburg uh, uh one in tomsk one in krasnoyarsk one in vladivostok so four um so what do you do in um in that space where um it's almost I don't want to relativize it and say that people need a different kind of approach to art just because the infrastructure is lacking but you do need slightly different sensibilities as to how you approach that uh community. So there for example in Novosibirsk we have a colleague who does things that are kind of not presentable in the <laughs> in the in the western art institutions so ie he would be doing children theater he would do, do public art uh, actually that, that's him anton kamanov uh, he's very much inspired by uh, uh maya hold the whole uh, russian um uh, constructivist uh, art scene from the 20s which had a a radical proposal of uh, marrying art and work so uh, uh work should be itself like art and art should be like work so there is a uh, multiple um threads that leads him to making this kind of practice in that location where it's not a contemporary art center and that makes sense because it actually um uh, uh activates the entire community and then um i also observe him um moving at multiple levels so he would engage with the community in a very grassroots level but at the same time he was able to since the city just got a uh, a, a leftist uh, government recently he's also able to mobilize the government the mayor at a very top level of cultural policy and not losing actually either aspect so i think that kind of engagement is 
in a place uh, in the absence of infrastructure is is um, certainly that something that we can learn from, but also may uh, provoke our most of engagement in the future. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to come in in terms of the exhibition formats and how, let's say, our geographical location in the continent, how we can look at what is happening elsewhere and be able to look at our own situation, how we can change. But I'm sure most of the exhibition formats that um, uh, art institutions are using in the continent where the infrastructure is a, it's a big challenge that uh, a number of countries do not have uh, contemporary art galleries there's no contemporary art galleries, there's no museums, but you still have artists who are working and practicing in those spaces, but they're exhibiting elsewhere where curators who are from the diaspora come in and be able to take artists across the other parts of the continent, which includes Asia, which includes Europe and America. But the, the, the challenge remains the availability of space within and how the audience within the continent can be able to, to benefit from what is happening elsewhere. A number of exhibitions that have taken place abroad, they've not been able to come back home to the local audience. But I would like to mention events that are taking place that includes the Dakar and the Bamako and a project that is happening in Cape Town which is called Infecting the City which to me is a very important intervention where art is not available in most public spaces, but infecting the city, which is a public art uh, festival that happens in Cape Town every year, it provides a model that other countries in the continent can be able to emulate. But the one challenge remains that in most African countries, public spaces are not public. So that's remain a bigger challenge, which I'm, I'm sure us as cultural practitioners in the continent, we have to challenge the status quo, to challenge the sp status quo so much that at least the public space which is not public can be accessible to the public because there's no point of having a public space which is not public. Um, actually, I also wanted to learn a little bit more um, with your work um, because you are in an institution. And when you when we think about, I think we're talking about imagining new geographies. We almost think about like, hey, we're, there's a pedagogical element, right? You're trying to to destabilize like the the very um, westernized canon of of um, geography. I'm talking mostly the cases of presenting um, these practices in the West, for example. But then in your case now, you have an institution, you you probably also, how do you kind of think it's a two-way situation, right? Like you, 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 you're trying to give a, a just maybe it's not the right word, but a nuanced representation of Zimbabwean art, either um, in, in your own country and abroad. Like how do you try to, who's your audience, like what, are there differences in, in how you try to mediate um, the, 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 the practices, for example? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a game, is it? It's, a, it's like a chess. Because one, I've worked a work, working in a public institutions in Zimbabwe, which is a national gallery founded 60 years ago. It's actually what happened 60 years when the gallery was formulated with a director who was European, half Scottish, half French, who was really connected to the Western world and be able to do things. And so what is what, what I do is basically to look at the blueprint, which was left by Frank McEwen, to say how can we continue to have that continuation of the artists locally, their visibility locally and internationally. It's a, it's a big challenge because you're working from a very shoestring budget, but through the network, you are able to be able to, to bring those artists to the international platforms. But it was also through uh, the inspiration that after studying in Europe, 
you build a network in Europe, and how do you uh, make the artists who do not have a platform to be seen into a bigger global community visible? So how we do that, I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult question, but I mean, it's, it's also to do with how can we have another perspective. The news that you get from Africa, it's always the news about the bad news. But it's not that the creative uh, community within the continent, they're just sitting idle. But what you are having in the continent is, it's a community that are really inspired by the challenges they face every day. And the challenges we face every day within the continent are also challenges that are faced globally. It's, they're different challenges. Today we have got the terrorism, we have got global warming, which is really affecting, I'm sure two weeks ago, the Southern Africa was battered with a cyclone, which left thousands and thousands of people dead. But it's also to do with how these artists respond to their own environment, how they respond, and how can that be seen outside their own communities. But our audience in, in the continent uh, the local audience and the international community because today because of mobility you also have traffic from across um, uh, the continents and when she was talking about your um, Eurasia project I'm also thinking about Afro-Asia project because today um, Africa has got a, a, a traffic between uh, China and Africa has grown and I'm sure there's what many people are talking about, the, 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 the new colonization of Africa by China and the visibility of the so-called Chinese or Kenyan pavilion with Chinese artists at the Venice Biennale a few years ago, which created a lot of controversy. So there's a lot of things that are happening between the continent and the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> It's, an, um, it's a question that we kind of avoid when we talk about infrastructures or connections or networks. So really, is, uh, is, 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 the question is, what kind, of, what kind of infrastructure and what kind of network do we want? Um, in one of the, um, I spell the research of Eurasia, uh, which, by the way, is non-exclusive, um, because if you go into the geological understanding of Eurasia, um, the, the landmass of Africa is actually deeply uh, enfolded into uh, today's Europe, so we're all kind of on the same landmass. Um, whereas, actually, the by the way, East Asia is drifting away. So Japan <laughs> and everything east of uh, Lake Baikal is drifting e eastward. Um, so these are these are extremely old and large, uh, larger than life um, infrastructures. But we're focused m on. Um, in many ways, um, the BRI, the the economic uh, ties, uh, and um, in trying to understand that, we go a little bit back in history to understand what kind of infrastructure, what kind of network there was in place. So um, I, I I I looked a lot into historical practices of the tributary network of China, and you could argue that it was. Chinese imperialism already 500 years ago. However, if you look into the practice, so the, the, the premise was asymmetry of power um, because you always needed to recognize the Chinese emperor as um, the absolute uh, center of the power, whereas the smaller polities have to enter into this tributary network. However, you look into the actual practice, um, the, the smaller polities, they had to send their um, uh, envoy uh, annually to either Beijing or Nanjing, depending on where the capital was. Uh, they, they they gifted the they sent uh, gifts to the Chinese emperor. They received in exchange, of course, a lot more gifts. That's not all. The critical point was that actually they were trading along the way. So they take the sea route to Nanjing or Beijing, and they were trading with various ports on the way. So everybody was essentially driven by their self interest, and everybody was happy. So. Um, it may seem counterintuitive to speak for imperialism of this kind, but if you look into hist historical um, uh, 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 research, there are nuances. 
and that would offer maybe a way for us to think about the networks and the infrastructure projects that's currently underway today and in also questioning that and in thinking what kind of people-to-people -people network or peer-to-peer -peer network um, that we can think about within the art world um, but also beyond. Um, maybe this is a moment I could ask Natasha to talk a little bit about the film you produced, uh, talking about these, you know, networks, how think how 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 through your practice or your work with other artists to kind of like really highlight um, events that are maybe not singular, like how how and also maybe later um, then uh, Antonia can talk a little bit about the ma the timeline project that was also in the exhibition at Savi. Yeah, um, I felt it was also perhaps relevant to um, highlight on this panel uh, Naim Mohammed's project, uh, Two Meetings and a Funeral, uh, which was uh, commissioned with Documenta 14, and I worked very closely with Naim on also what it meant to construct this kind of film that had anchored itself around this sort of two strategic historic points, um, which is the 1973 uh, non-aligned movement uh, conference in Algiers, um, and then the 1974 meeting with the Organization for Islamic Cooperation, um, while Bangladesh is uh, struggling for UN recognition. And it it's in one of the one of the protagonists in his film is Vijay Prasad, who says that the third world um, is not a place but a project, and you know this in a sense. Naim, as a filmmaker artist, looks at this project not in its kind of um, not as a sort of optimist glorifying it, but actually really trying to understand again like what is the timeline um, that that circulates as part of these meetings what could possibly happen behind the scenes but also what is staged before us um, in terms of which leaders speak in what kind of way what mode of address um, is put on the table um, and at the same time his one of his other protagonists um, was is uh, Zonaid Saki, who's a leftist leader in Bangladesh. Um, you know, so what I really enjoyed about this kind of, let's say, um, creating a kind of cine geography, um, you know, as perhaps Kojo Ishun would put it, is um, that it it locates itself in the present while arguing for certain kinds of unresolved um, yet crucial solidarities. Um, and uh, in, f in, f in other conferences, what has come up, of course, is um, also to, to perhaps look at the, the kind of pan-African festivals which happened also as equally important to these big kind of international geopolitical meetings. Um, so, no, I mean, you, you would know more, but I, I know that Chimurenga has done like, incredible research on Festac. Um, you know, so there's so many other examples uh, that we could use uh, as part of this process of exhibition as research um, to map those moments. Yeah, actually, that's a good moment to... Um, so there, there are images sometimes there about yeah the, the timeline that you were talking about, which was a, essentially a kind of non-linear attempt to create a sort of cartography of major new, uh, let's say, geographical constructions, um, more or less of mostly the 1800s and the 1900s. Um, so really new you know, the, the making of nations, so to speak, the forming of new alliances, you know, beyond us, so let's say, canonical geographical divisions. Um, but also one of the questions we had, given that all of this was really mostly curatorial research, was how do we, how do we transfer that into the exhibition, actually? You know, without setting an overtly scholarly tone and without, you know, uh, ending up ultimately mostly showing books or, you know, literally research material as we found it. Um, and, and that was actually quite, an, uh, quite, quite a challenge. And that's why then we use ourselves, the, the, the mapping actually, as a tool to 
showcase research that then was related to cartographic projects, actually. Um, and just to respond to a few things also that were said, actually, one of the main projects that we were looking at uh, was actually the notion of Eurafrica. Um, also, through the work of artists, um, including, for example, a beautiful piece by, uh, by Heba Amin, who was actually looking at this type of you know, technocratic fantasies of the beginning of the, of the 20th century, in which literally, uh, you know, the idea was to literally merge the two continents. And so, particularly, for example, a project by Hermann Sergel, who was actually a, a German engineer who basically wanted to sunk the Mediterranean and make of the two continents one place in a kind of extremely pan-European um, ideology, um, but also actually the huge role that Africa played in the constitution of the European Union, and so hence how a sort of coordinated exploitation of the raw materials that Europe lacked was understood as a central aspect by which keeping peace within the European Union itself and within European powers. So actually the Conference of Rome I think it was 56, was, was quite in 1956, was quite an important, an important starting point for us. Because also what we wanted to highlight, of course, was thinking about the locality in which we were, which was Berlin, you know? And, and hence, we were like really trying to, um, you know, to, to also question in that sense also what the so-called borders of the European, these sort of invisible borders of the European actually are, of the European Union. So looking, for example, also at, you know, the massive amount of money that, for example, Germany is pumping into Niger, you know, to create a kind of new invisible border there, you know, new forms also of uh, you know border monitoring technology and how those kind of uh, you know increase and developed in the last sort of 200 years um, so from actual walls and partitions to um, you know new invisible softwares and so on um, yeah and then I mean maybe to respond also to the question of the exhibition I think also that maybe what we mean with exhibition is something that needs to be constantly negotiated you know and depends you know from place to place and of course also what publicness means and what public space means uh, follows the same logic you know also can we think about public space and and this is something maybe that you did also already for example in in documenta like can we think about right radio you know as a public space can we think about newspapers for example like you know how can we expand also the notion of of public space and and of exhibitions which anyway is something that has been done since the 70s so how do we reactivate let's say those forms maybe in times in which the, the white cube is also extremely predominant uh, again yeah, I definitely agree. I think um, the question about the exhibition as a format is just like, I just wanted to bring it up in a way that how we are mindful of the responsibility of representation, which I think through all your projects, you very eloquently also like display and, and articulate that. So I just, I think it's just the notion of curatorial responsibility, which was just the terminology that just also came up in our conversation. Like, how do you use that, you know, position and what, how do you what, how do you decide to show what and how do you, what kind of ruptures you're trying to create? So I think that was, yeah, I think it's very evident in all of your 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 work that you're constantly also questioning yourself and your position and the kind of uh, platforms that is available to you and resources. I think that's also quite clear. Um, it was very funny when I I had a uh, I. When I talked to me before the presentation, this this conversation, you talked a little bit about just also tying into what you said about sensibility. You know, like I think um, for Natasha, your project, uh, you you also talked about um, genealogy a lot, and I think um, in your uh, your contribution to Hello World, like how like how do you consider this juxtaposition of different sensibilities of artistic styles, um, it kind of trying to interfere with this kind of Western canon of art in itself, because I know that you're also, you're very interested in trying to break that boundary a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about it, like in terms of, form, like in your, in your approach? Um, yeah, I think, it, I think the, I think the way that you might structure um, what what I, I actually call the exhibition. It was my part was not called Hello World. My part was actually a your response contribution to, that. to yeah. Um, but it was called Arrival Incision. 
um, Indian modernity as, as a peripatetic itinerary. And so it was actually more thinking about incision as this sort of literal cut um, that departs and that makes way at the same time um, as a suture in a sense later. Um, so the methodology was, as I said, as I mentioned, also to uh, create uh, an, an even ground in which uh, kind of respected sort of German uh, figure from the canon could be also then um, seen in relation. So, I mean, not, 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 so what does it mean to actually see in relation in terms of exhibition making? So one of the other strategies has also been to kind of break through the, the kind of timeline of the modern. Um, and uh, one of the strategies also within the same exhibition was, for instance, to bring in a sculpture of an artist like Mira Mukherjee, who trained in Munich, um, but who was for some reason not part of this collection. Um, to bring her into the collection uh, alongside a mother goddess figure uh, from um, from the collection of the Ethnological Museum, which was actually brought in by the same archaeologist who created this modern Indian art collection. So the vision of the archaeologist, in a sense, had brought together all of these paintings from the 50s to 70s, but um, the museum had not had still wanted to keep the separation between antiquity and the modern, and I felt that that was somehow uh, a kind of an injustice, and it needed to be seen in a in the same frame. So um, that that was the attempt. But also, um, I mean, this happens all the time, um, even with say, kind of let's say a figure like uh, Maya Duran, for instance. You know, we sort of celebrate Maya Duran. Um, for going to Haiti and for you no know, kind of documenting um, ritual pos acts of possession and all of this, but um, what we tried to do when we showed Maya Duran's work and research on Haiti um, was to pair her with Andre Pierre, who was a self-trained artist, um, agriculturist, and voodoo priest, who actually was very much in dialogue with her, and it was through their friendship that she had access um, and, and had an, developed an understanding of what uh, what these rituals were, what ground they were on and, and what ground she was on uh, when she was there practicing um, and documenting. So those are some examples, perhaps, of working in this way. Uh, me, maybe, because uh, you, can you talk a little bit uh, about your soul presentation? Because we, we were, when we were chatting, you talked about the mo how you were juxtaposing different forms of s shamanistic knowledge through that emerged from your research in this um, Eurasian project. And how are you also very carefully presenting it? Because I think there is a danger when, when you tr when not contextualized in a proper way, could have seen, could have been seen a uh, strange kind of appropriation or exotic, exoticizing these kind of practices. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that project. Yeah. I also really appreciate just uh, what Natasha um, uh, uh, put in place. I, I think in connection to uh, uh, Maya Darren's project, I, so one of our starting points is, of course, the uh, Eurasian project of Yusuf Boys and Namjoon Pak. And of course, looking back, we could also um, question the um, from the um, uh, perspective of cultural appropriation, was Boys actually consciously um, uh, constructing this Tatar myth? and? Does it involve cultural appropriation in it? Um, and then that's and then the question of sensibility actually comes in because when looking back at the seventies and being mindful of the um, social context, it was very much of a moment of Germany having this vicious wonder, everybody um, um, not dealing uh, working through the past of Nazi uh, history, but um, very much um, engaging themselves in the, the, the building of the nation. So that's when Boyce and a lot of his artists um, actually decided to look for other forms of knowledge and in a way to escape Europe. Right, so there are interesting, I think, um, dynamism in that era, which also um, 
should uh, should be considered when we think when we uh, try to evaluate what he was actually doing. So to come back to also the connection to uh, Maya Dayan, um the boy is of, was of course uh, very much inspired by shamanism, and in some ways, looking back at some of his performances, you could say that he was almost a shaman. But the the question is really, are you able to um, convey that through the documentation of the performance? Um, or through the um, video documentation of a shamanic ceremony. It seems to me that um, also this comes out of personal experience, it comes from uh, engagement with artists who have similar um, uh, personal investments in, 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 um, in, in this kind of research. It seems that it takes a, a door and a key. Sometimes you have the key. Sometimes you don't have the you have the key, but you don't have the door. You, sometimes you have the door, you don't have the key. It really uh, takes this sort of synchronization for something magic to happen. Um, having said that, it actually doesn't mean that an artist who is interested in sh say the shamanic tradition of Siberia should actually make a work about shamanic tradition of Siberia. Uh, you could achieve the same effect with the door and the key uh, by having completely different uh, appearances. So that kind of goes into, um, so thinking about this as a special configuration of space, time, and consciousness, and um, agents, uh, that was how we put together the program for Seoul uh, as part of uh, Unmapping Eurasia in the first iteration last year. Um, the project has a title, Eurasian Steps, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a play on words because we have first um, the steps as, as in taking a step and in walking um, the body of Eurasia, which um, we took the inspiration from, from Boys and, and Pike, but also Eurasian steps as in the step area between the taiga and uh, the dry and mountainous um, part of Eurasia continent. Um, and the exhibition or it was a walking exhibition was, config was configured as such that you have um, uh, artists as storytellers and in some ways um, uh, catalysts um, walking with uh, a group of audience through a few selected spots or on a few on a, uh, three different routes through the city of Seoul. We departed actually from the birthplace of uh, Namjoon Park and went uh, through a mountain route, a water route, and a culture route. And, and there, the artists would have this very unassuming role of telling their stories. We had, uh, for example, Payam Sharifi from Slavs and Tatas. We had uh, Femke Herigunfus from um, uh, a, a Dutch artist looking at infrastructure. But they have to change the mode of communication. Um, and as we spent, the first day was uh, spent uh, doing this walking, and the second and third day we went into a um, very remote part of Korea where you have an anarchist Buddhist temple and an anarchist Buddhist monk. So we spent some days uh, in that setting reflecting on Eurasia and reflecting on our uh, roles um, as artists and curators. I see that we have some very little time left. Just wanted to open it up to the floor in case there are any questions. No questions? Okay. Well, <laughs> well, the window's still open. Um, well, you just, uh, uh, well, I think one thing, I think it was just somehow haunting a little bit, at least in my head, the notion of the body. You know, I think with this notion of walking, you know, experience time and space kind of in opposition to this idea of representation. You know, like how 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 do you think about the notion of presence and representation through your 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 research or in the way you uh, present voices, practices or or different kind of um, timelines? Maybe it's a bit of an abstract question, but I thought maybe yeah very very abstract can you um okay so um the notion of the cartographer i mean i'm just thinking as a geographer um how this this bird's eye view of space and maybe that's more departing from me's uh, specific project that it is 
a physical interaction. Like you do go with through time and space to do deep research in, well, not only research, but also engagement. The audience has to join this journey that isn't a dedication, it is an engagement. How do, how do you think about, maybe this is a notion of body, notion of time, notion of other things that kind of create that very, that ex experience, I would say, like of, or encounters perhaps, I would say, into the works, the kind of exhibitions you, you present or, or yeah, to, to, yeah, basically that's, that's how I try to um, encapsulate it in I was thinking, words. yeah, um, I was moderating a panel uh, a few days ago uh, with George Lewis, and it was actually about the work of Terry Atkins. And there was something that I think is quite interesting that he was saying, you know, the difference between describing and engaging. And I think that's for me also the difference between the bird eye view and, and, and the dealing with, you know, getting, uh, <laughs> engaging, getting, yeah, I mean, I don't know, I'm lacking now words, but it's really about a kind of horizontality of engagement, um, of uh, getting dirty with something also, no? like participating and not just trying to represent or describe from above. And that's for me maybe, yeah, the interesting thing between, um, that maybe also speaks to different types of institutional practices, right? And ways of presenting, uh, for example, even geographical exhibitions, which are also, you know, that doubles word, in the sense that really depending on how that's treated, uh, it might be extremely reductive or extremely profound. So um, I think that the, the matter of perspective, so the body versus, is uh, versus the sky, maybe, is an interesting way of, uh, of putting it. Um, well, I guess this also kind of ties into this idea that Natasha talks about the, actually the meeting after, um, outside of the film, Naima Amim's work that beyond the film, you were explaining that there was a moment. So I think maybe that was what I was more kind of pointing towards, like how, and also about when you talked about um, the institution you're working at, how it is also a civic space. So it also, the, the artwork or the exhibition creates a condition or is a catalyst for something to happen. And you know, how, how does one orchestrate it through their work, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can I can um, go into that example um, with with what ha what happened with uh, Naim's work beyond the film, um, but I actually wanted to. It also struck me somewhere in this conversation to um, point towards this fact that so many of the times, like uh, you were mentioning, how certain exhibitions that we do um, or artists that that we work with we do this away from our own geography for many reasons and there's a lack let's say um, which really cannot only be blamed uh, towards for infrastructure lack but actually a lack in of many kinds um, which prevents these kind of quite important uh, moments in in um, in the kind of sharing of of art, uh, of where ideas kind of make their imprint, they they unfortunately do not then uh, get replicated or in our own context. And this is something that still feels uh, a, a little bit of a, a blind spot and a, a missed opportunity that one needs to tackle really head on. Um, there are different reasons for this, right? Like um, one example uh, for me was um, doing an exhibition that really tried to unravel um, the morphology of riots and the kind of r impact of riots within the social fabric. Um, and for many reasons, uh, it's not an exhibition that could be done in India at this point. It was an exhibition that happened in Berlin. And it was not satisfactory to just stop there um, because a lot of the examples actually came from the region. Um, and so this is just a question I have for, my, for, for you know, us uh, as, uh, as diasporic practitioners um, of purposefully being dislocated. Um, how do we relocate some of our imprints back 
uh, how do we do that? Um, that's just something I actually wanted to stay with. And the other part, very quickly, um, with Naeem Mohammed's project, Two Meetings and a Funeral, uh, a really um, momentous uh, occasion was when the protagonist of this film, uh, who came Vijay Prasad from New York, uh, Samia Zanadi from Algiers, and Zonayat Saki from uh, Bangladesh, uh, came together to meet in person. So there was also a physical meeting of the protagonists uh, in Castle. And a kind of a debate, really, um, to to talk about uh, the film, but also to talk about their own kind of uh, political realities and, and positioning. Um, so that was one way that the bodies, let's say, kind of come together to commune. Um, that's beyond the frame of the work itself, but it becomes the work. Yeah, I think this well, the the whole notion of diaspora is very interesting, especially in our generation. Uh, I feel that um, th how, what do you represent? Like, for example, I live in Amsterdam. I'm from Hong Kong. I think all of us are at some point in in our in our biography is traveling or, or living in other places, and I think particularly this idea of representing a geography makes oneself, at least for me, very uncomfortable, which I guess also we all share um, this discomfort of needing to kind of pigeonhole or fulfill that kind of expecta expected um, representation, which I guess in a way we are all somehow hopefully transnational, uh, or we operate in a transnational way and also think in a transnational way, yet also try to reconnect new nodes um, as in the net networks that I think all of you in in different ways in your practice tries to recreate new geographies through your practice. And I think that, well, oh, it is, I think we can just end on this note. Well, thank you so much everyone for, for your insightful contributions. Um, thank you everyone for hanging in with us on a Friday night. Um, well, anyway, thank you everybody. A round of applause.